Hello, everybody. We know that designers and architects, they're good people. They want to do positive things for the world. And there are a lot of things, big problems facing the world. And what we're trying to discuss in these talks is, can the solutions that designers are coming up with actually solve these big problems? The, the problem we're talking about this morning is pollution. This is the image we've been using as the poster for the pollution talks. And in a, a couple of examples, Dan Rosegaard, a Dutch designer, has invented this smog tower, and the idea is that that takes pollution out of the air. There are a few of them in, in China, but how many of these would we need to really make a difference? And we've identified that plastic in the oceans is a really serious problem. So this is an ocean cleanup, one of several projects that are looking at ways of harvesting plastic from the seas. We've got three fantastic speakers. Dave Hackens is an industrial designer. So my name is uh, Dave, and I have a few examples of the work I usually do related to this topic. I started being interested in the topic of waste when I studied, and I made this pen. So usually if you have a pen, you only need the ink, and the rest you throw away, which is a lot of waste. So I figured, what if you make a pen that you can eat, so you don't have any waste? And I kind of liked this, so I put this on my website, but it didn't really do anything, because it was just sort of the student project. So for another project, I figured I want to do it that it can sort of grow a little bit. So I made an ID for a modular phone, so you don't have to throw it away every two years. And another project I'm working on now is plastic waste. This is a landfill in Kenya from above. It's kind of a nice material. If you work with it properly and you arrange it a bit, you play with the colors. So we make machines to recycle this plastic, and the machines, how to make them, we share open source online for free, so people all over the world can actually just download and build them locally themselves. So basically you have something like flower pots, you shred it and you turn it into something new. And you can make tiles or an iPhone case or uh, yeah, many other options. And we have one shipping container where the whole recycling place is set up. And so people can just make them themselves as well. And in this way, it sort of spreads a little bit more around <laughs> the world without me having to do anything for it. I just share it online and sort of can scale up a little bit. Thanks very much, Dave. And over to you now, Bernard. My name is Bernard. I'm actually from Austria. And I want to explain a bit more about one of my projects, which is called This is Ecoside. So this project started when we went with the Design Academy to the International Criminal Court. And I wanted to ask them one question. I asked them if they are investigating in environmental crimes. And they told me no. So I was like, that's very strange that one of the biggest courts in the world doesn't deal with a factor which can kill a lot of people, but it just takes a longer time till effects are actually shown. So I started to investigate into this court and into its history. And what I found out is that in the beginning, when we drafted the founding document of it, there were actually 12 crimes. And ecocide, so the extreme destruction of the environment, was part of it. But this list of crimes got reduced first to six and then to three crimes. And when I met Polly Higgins, the lawyer who wrote the ecocide law, how it exists nowadays, she told me that this ecocide law was actually removed because of the lobbying of four countries. The US, the UK, France and the Netherlands. And back then I was like, what should I do? I was 25 years old, graduating from Design Academy. How can I work on a field of international law? So I thought, well, the only thing I'm kind of good in is I could visualize things and build things. And Polly, as a lawyer, had a beautiful story, but she needed a stage to speak out. So I built her literally a stage and invite her and other professionals to speak about this law, about the doubts, about benefits, about what can we do in the fields of law. And I filmed Polly behind the stage and I'm sharing these videos online on a digital stage so that everybody can enjoy it and also inform themselves and with this project, actually, one very, very strange thing happened. People told me it's going to be the end of plastic, the end of concrete. And I really disagree, because it's not going to be the end of plastic. It's just going to be a new beginning of new kinds of plastics, which are now already developed, but need to be implemented and given the laws to be used, actually. Eline, tell us about your work. I'm um, co-founder of Dupel Strijkers, which is a Rotterdam-based 
uh, office for innovative interiors, architecture and urban uh, interventions. And we have a strong belief that design can act as, a, as an agent for social renewal. That leads to strategies that contribute to a circular and inclusive economy. A circular uh, talking about um, uh, closing uh, material, energy, uh, water uh, cycles and inclusive by um, creating implementary trajectories for people with a distance to the labor market. So uh, we think that uh, this new time we're living in is really exciting for us as designers because we can come up with answers on very urgent questions in society. This is one of our interiors, which is a completely circular with a new flexible concept in which you can make many, many different configurations. So I think it shows that we as a designer can play a role in transition process, and I think that's really interesting. And um, you mentioned the term circular there, and, and um, you, you, you're a firm believer in uh, the circular economy. Explain to everyone what that means. What is the circular economy? Yeah. What is a circular project? Yeah. Circular in, in general for us means that we try to uh, close cycles. We are uh, very much aware of the fact that we should move away from a linear uh, system to uh, uh, a circular system. And a linear system is where you put materials in at one end and, exactly. and waste comes out at exactly. the other end. Yeah. So, so uh, how does that actually work in, in this case then? So when this office is no longer required, what happens to the material? Here, for example, everything is based on the measurements of the material. So we did not design a configuration which we liked in, in measurements, but the measurements is, are a result of the, the materials we used. And those materials were finally resulting in a kind of uh, uh, objects and configurations. So the materials are kind of can be reused afterwards. So they can be reused one to one. Actually, maybe it's a good chance to bring Tim in. Tim, Tim, do you want to come here? Because we're we're in a building now which is kind of circular. Tim is the the guy who was involved in the commissioning of this project. Maybe you could briefly tell us about it. The building you're in is actually a giant experiment. It's a living lab. It's our attempt to build a 100% circular building in a very thorough way. So all the materials you see here. They're borrowed for 10 days, and in a week from now, on Monday, it will be torn down, and all the materials go back to the suppliers we borrowed these materials from. There is no screwing, no drilling, no gluing, no sawing, so all the materials are left untouched. And the tiles you see covering the outside of the building, they're actually made with the plastic waste of the inhabitants of Antwerp. So this is actually a big material depot in the shape of a building. Thank you very much. Dave, these, th this project, the projects that Aline was showing and your work, I mean, they, they, they make great stories. They're great at communicating the issues they face. But can this really be a solution to pollution on a global scale? No, I don't think so. But I also think these problems are so complex and so big, it's not one solution that's going to fix it. It's going to be all these little solutions together that sort of have an impact. So maybe our c contribution is 0.1%, but that's more than nothing. So I would say you just need a lot of these initiatives that, that try to solve these problems or work on it. And you've engaged with, with big companies such as Google. Uh, do those companies, do they, they believe in, in this kind of future, or are they just pretending to be interested because it makes them look good? I would say I'm skeptical about that. Um, mainly, for instance, I noticed it with the Foamlux project. They care about making a profit. That's sort of where the company is built around. And I think at some point that's going to interfere with each other. So I would say it's always better if it comes really from the people to the solutions. Berlin, same question to you with the clients that you're working with. Is this a kind of just a bit of PR and window dressing, or do they really believe in a commitment no, I to don't, change? I don't think so. I see that we work for uh, big clients like uh, KPN or uh, ABN AMRO, and uh, they have the ambition to participate uh, in the new economy. And uh, they see that they cannot continue in the way they do now. 
So it's not like um, uh, window dressing. And Bernhard, your, your solution, uh, the, the, the Ecoside project that you were talking about, is a, is a different approach, which is basically let's change the system. Let's introduce a law that outlaws this. Uh, how has that been going down with, with, with lawmakers? I think the interesting thing about this, and I would, well, if you think about the company, a company has a CEO, but it also has a board, but the CEO gets hired to generate profit. If a CEO of a mining company tries to change the technology with which they are mining, but they might let make less profit, this CEO could risk his job. So actually, to just decide, yeah, we're going to do everything sustainable, but even though we make profit, might not work for bigger corporations. But if they would have the possibility to say, look, this is proposed, this might become a crime now, this might become a crime in five years, let's change our way of how our company works, then we can be ahead in the future. I want to ask all of you, you're, you're all designers, and designers produce stuff. We did it, one of the panels yesterday was uh, a designer called Babette Porcelain, who has written a book which investigates uh, the things that are contributing to climate change. And the biggest culprit is stuff the products that we all have, and in fact her symbol was a, was a mobile phone. Like, that creates a bit of a paradox for designers. How do you all respond to that paradox? Uh, well, I would say that's definitely in the last years always sort of the main thing. Like you, you kind of want to make something because you're a designer and you're educated to make things, but very often you realize that making something is not always the best solution to create really something physical. So sometimes it's more about changing someone's mindset or giving them other ways how to live their life, which probably or could have more impact instead of creating something new. So I think, for instance, for the plastic project, we're really focusing on giving people the tools to do it. So we're more focused on sharing the knowledge of how to recycle plastic. But that said, other people that start recycling, they also need to make something out of it. And that is always like, then you start thinking, what do, what do I need to make? I know I can now turn this trash into something, but what is the something going to be? And I think that's um, a challenging question, yeah, because on the one hand, we already have enough. And Bernhard, do you also design things? Do you also create stuff? Or have you decided that communicating ways of introducing new laws is a more powerful tool as a designer? Law, it's so abstract. It's, something, it's like a fiction. It's like a story we create to follow it in a way. And I like to create this in materiality because it makes it tangible. But the difficult thing, especially as a young designer, is that you want to use materials which are not bad for the environment, but you can't afford them. They're too expensive. You have to, especially if you're a student, you have to work with the materials you can afford. I want to build a stage for Ecoside, but if I really want to make it 100% sustainable, I can't do it. So people always told me, why did you use plastic for this piece? And I was just like, why is the plastic guilty of being bad rather than using this plastic to create a better future in the sense like that the material doesn't have any guilt, but just then the purpose of it like, is uh, different. Aline, do you have, a, do you have a, an opinion on this? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good one. Should we feel guilty or not by what we're doing? I think as long as you try to add value in, yeah, with what you're doing and uh, really try to make a change and to make uh, projects uh, with meaning and no bullshit, then I think uh, we add value and I think it's uh, appropriate to, uh, to create. We were talking before about the talk, and, and, and it's like it can get a little bit depressing, can't it? When you think <laughs> no, like I, I would say with me, it's the other way around. It's sort of before you think, I could make something pretty, but there are already so many pretty things. Yeah, do we need a pretty thing? But now you sort of have this whole range of problems you could work on, and it's just a matter of you pick one of them and you just start. And everything what you do probably is going to make it a little bit better. So I would say it's more, I would, I would have 20 topics I want to work on. I just don't have the time to it. So I would say it's more in inspiring than depressing. And, and plastic has come up a lot on this talk. Let's talk about plastic. So how are you all, in your projects, how are you all handling um, the idea of plastic? Is pla should we not use plastic at all, or should we just use plastic more responsibly? Tell us a little bit about how you engage with this material, which has become like the kind of the, the, the devil of, of one of the devils of our time. Um, so for me, I personally, I'm not sure if I really like plastic. 
because in on the one hand, it's kind of an amazing material, the thing you can do with it, and it lasts super long. For instance, the metal rusts away, the wood rots, rots away, but plastic's going to stay for a very long time. But for some reason, we use it to make the most disposable things out there, which last like seconds. Um, so I think that's fundamentally wrong, how we see plastic. And overall, personally, I would prefer to work with more organic materials that are just um, more biodegradable. But I also cannot deny all the plastic that is already out there. So I think in the long run, you kind of want to avoid making plastic from oil. But I think for now, it's really key to keep on recycling the things we already made. And what about other materials? Like, do, do, you, do you investigate the manufacturing of the, of the material to, to, to check that it, would, it was, had minimal impact? How far do you go when you're, if you're specifying some timber or some, some concrete or something now, like that? Uh, what, what we um, see now is that there is a, uh, a new certification which is called uh, the well uh, standard. And what I see is that in the last 10 years, the focus was really on energy. And now with the well standard, you see that the materials and where the materials come from and the, the qualities of the materials is really precise, calculated, and uh, we should take that into uh, consideration. It helps us a lot in taking decisions. So um, uh, who makes it, how is it produced, what uh, elements are exactly precisely in those uh, materials we, we want to use for projects. It's the material thing is actually an interesting aspect. I graduated from a school for mechanical engineering and industrial design in Austria, but what we got taught was the main plastics. So you knew all the specifications of those plastics, you knew where you can use it for, but you never really knew the specifications about like um, sustainable plastics. So that's actually nice if you would have a database of like, oh, I have these traditional ones, but I could also use this one, which is sustainable and has the same specifications. So mm -hmm. I think to make this clear that there is an alternative that would be really great. One of the points that came up yesterday in one of the talks was that, that education has, has not kept up with the way that the world is changing. Do you agree with that? Do you think that our design schools should really be putting these things on the agenda more than they are? Yeah, I, I agree. I, see, I, I really see that uh, students or um, people who come to work for us, young, young people especially, they really miss the, the method um, to participate in a, in, in a design studio where those yeah, core values like, uh, yeah, creating social and ecological projects, that they do not have those uh, uh, methods in hand. So we're calling on design schools around the world to, 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 to wise up to this and, yeah, and, and better prepare. Change. You see a change in education as well. You're seeing it changing yeah, already? I, I see it, yeah. I participate as a, as a, as a tutor myself uh, as well. And you see that many master uh, uh, at, uh, schools they do focus on a program now, of course, in which you train your students to, uh, to come up with, with answers. And they, they know how to do that. And your, your Precious Plastics project, Dave, it, 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 did, do you see, is that like, a, is that like a, a communication project or is that a, a, a really a viable system that can scale up and, and help? I don't know. So we, the main goal is just there's a lot of plastic waste out there and we could recycle it. So. That's, it started as my graduation project, so I built machines so people could start recycling. That seemed like a good step. And then the next step was, okay, now people, it would be nice if they could really build these machines. So I made more instruction videos, step by step, how to really make them so people could really get the knowledge. So then it was really about communicating the things you made. And now we made a new version, which was really more about the community. So if people want to get started, that they can find each other locally. And we also set up more the infrastructure around it, so you have an online marketplace. If people made something, they can sell it, but they can also buy and sell machine parts. So I think the project sort of evolves in whatever direction is needed to go forward to recycle more plastic. So sometimes it's really about building machines, then it's more about the community. So it, it depends a bit whatever's needed. We're almost out of time. Does anyone have any questions? This is a, a really huge topic. Yes, over there. Do we have a microphone? A question? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering also if you could uh, push uh, the politicians more so that they would the tax companies more if they use uh, harmful materials? I think it's easy to say that we have to push them. It's, it's the easy way to do. You should do it. You should change it. 
but I believe that this is a very arrogant way. I think we should not push them, but rather try to support them to make those things actually happen. If we help them with initiatives, if we help them with proposals, we are actually contributing more than if we would demonstrate the whole time and tell them you have to do it, you have to do it, but then we're not actually engaging. I think like if we all come up with initiatives and say, let's do this and sh look, we managed it on a small scale, you could do it on a bigger one, then they will also get inspired and create change, I believe. Actually, in my own experience in, in the UK, dealing with politicians, it's, it's, it's exactly what you're saying. It's like, they're, they're not stupid people, they just don't know. They just don't meet architects and designers or design journalists very often. They meet other people who have strong interests and who lobby them continually. One criticism of the design system is that there isn't enough engagement. Designers and architects don't go and tell their amazing stories to people and you have to tell it again and again and again and you have to be very nice and, and polite about it. I guess that's kind of similar to what you're saying. Great. Uh, thanks so much for all of the speakers. Thanks so much for the audience for coming. And I think just to leave with, with two thoughts, I think uh, the, 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 one of the messages that's coming through loud and clear from all the talks is we, we all have to do something. Like the 0.1% change that um, everyone can make will make a difference. But I think also it's like super exciting the work that Bernhard is doing. Like if we can also work with people to change, f insist on change from the, the very, very top, that's like... That's really important as well. Thank you all very, very much.